Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear your testimony about how God is using Destiny in your life. You can visit our website at destinychurchjacksonville.com and click on the testimony link. Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can also do so online. Now, get ready to receive an amazing word from the Lord. Well, I know it's a little different today having our children in here for them and for you, so I will try to teach quickly, okay? And I normally do, so um, try to keep up. Well, we have been on a series, This Is That, and Pastor Chris has been breaking down uh, some of the things that we do on a Sunday morning and really some of the things that we do as a believer and explaining why we do them. Well, I'm going to continue that theme today and hopefully explain to you why we make such a big deal out of children, why we pray over them, why we do baby dedications, why we have kids' church, why we have nursery. And my message today is titled End Game. Now, as a parent, I have played a lot of games with my children over the years. We've played board games, card games, school games, and they all have one thing in common, that there is an objective in order to win. They have an end game, right? And the most difficult games I have found to play are the brand new ones that none of you have ever played before and you don't have a coach to help you know how to play it. And um, because those, they just like, the idea kind of seems a little blurry, the rules don't really make sense, but if you can figure out what the end game is, it helps everything else to fall in place. And so my encouragement to you today is that God has given us an end game when it comes to parenting because sometimes parenting can be like that new game. We have this cute little bundle of joy and then we leave with that bundle of joy and get home and we find out how quickly things can get messy, right? And so it, I'm so thankful that God has given us that. So in John 17, 3, Jesus says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ to who you have sent. Matthew 28, 18 goes a little deeper and it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. Go increase your 401k. Go climb to the top of the ladder. Go build an empire. Go have a lot of fun. No, it does not say any of those things. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. All of life is to be lived to know him and to make him known. Now, I don't want anyone in here to check out on me today because I am speaking to parents, but you know what? I'm also speaking to everyone else in the room because this mandate was given to every one of us. We each have a part to play in that. Disciple making is our calling. See, men, man and woman, they were created in God's image, and God said, be fruitful and multiply. But the command to be fruitful and multiply wasn't just so that there would be more people in the world. It was so that there would be more people that look like Jesus in the world. That is what we are supposed to multiply. That's what we're supposed to do in our children, and we all have a part to play. Now, what you give to your children, to those you disciple, isn't near as important as what you leave in them, who you help them to be. It's the difference in inheritance versus legacy. We can leave a large material inheritance, but that does not compare to what a legacy of faith will do for our children. Now, there are three ways that we leave a legacy, and we're going to talk about those today. It's by being strategic, deliberate, and consistent. Now, we are three-part people in the image of our three-part God. We are spirit, we are soul, we are body, and we know the importance of being strategic and being consistent and deliberate in most of these areas, but it's true in all of them. We know that without proper nutrition and care, a body will not thrive, right? Right? We know that if a child is abused or neglected, they are damaged at the soul level, in their mind and heart and emotions, that our soul needs love and nurture. Well, it's true in the spirit also. Without attention, a spirit will be weak. We have to be strategic. So my first point is we've got to be strategic, and our strategy must be in word and deed. Now, this is true in our parenting, and it's also true in our disciple-making. You've got to say it. Speak scripture over your children and then tell them where to find it because you might be speaking and to them it's just words. They don't know it's coming from the word of God. Apply scripture to your discussions and your decisions. Talk scenarios through with your children. Apply truth to a movie, to a song. My children fuss at me because um, whenever we watch a movie, I give biblical commentary. I just can't help it. 
I'm like, oh, did you, did you hear that bad attitude? Like, their parents really need to do something about that. Or did you see the bad decisions he made and the consequences that followed? And I know that they fuss about it, but you know what the reality is? They're starting to anticipate it for themselves because I am teaching them to think critically. And I'm teaching them to act upon the worldview that we have created for them. Are you creating a biblical worldview for yourself and for your children? Because let me just tell you right now, if you're not, they don't have one. Because having a biblical worldview will not happen accidentally. And just because you are a believer does not mean that you have a biblical worldview. Many, many believers do not filter their lives through the word of God. The way you create a biblical worldview is by filtering everything through the Bible. Teach your children how to do that. Be active in doing that for yourself. Now, we have gone to St. Augustine for Christmas almost every Christmas since we moved here. And we always ride one of those red trolleys where they sing the Christmas carols and they give you the little glasses. You know the ones that they are either Santa Claus or snowmen or they have candy canes on them. They're really cool when you put them on. Every light that you look at has that image on it. My favorite are the stars. So everywhere you look in St. Augustine, you see a star. That's what it's like to have a biblical worldview. Having a biblical worldview is much like putting on a pair of those glasses. You see Jesus in everything. Describe to your children how those glasses cause you to see the environment, how you view certain movies, how you choose a book, how you communicate, and the decisions you make. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you believe his every word and you teach his every word, it may not be politically correct. It may not be considered socially tolerant, but it will be the most loving view you have ever embraced. Teach your children to see that way. I cannot stress this enough. This is one of the greatest gifts that you can give your children. Parents want to give their kids good things. This is one of the greatest, greatest gifts. If you do not help them establish a biblical worldview, you are making their future walk with the Lord more difficult. There is no nice way to say it. You must be strategic in your parenting, in your disciple making. Your goal is not to make your children happy. I, I believe that as a society, we have believed that lie. That is not our goal. It is to train them to look like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to act like Jesus. You are doing them a disservice if you focus on fleeting happiness over long-term health. There are three ways that this is strategically accomplished. The first is when the two most powerful influences in the world work together to put Jesus first. Now, the world may disagree, but biblically, the two most powerful influences in the world are the home and the church. God tells his story through your family. Let me, let me bring some freedom to some of you today. You will not be a perfect parent. You will not raise perfect children. That is not even the goal. The goal is not to make our homes perfect. The goal is that our homes be a breeding ground for God's grace. It should be a safe place for God to demonstrate redemption. And I'm going to say something else that will free a lot of you. He chose you. Mm -hmm. Out of all the parents in the world, he chose you. Let that, let that just settle in for a second. He chose you. He, he knew where your children would fall in the birthplace, in, in, in the birth order. He knew where you would be living. He knew who their leaders would be. He knew all those things, and he chose to give them to you. When you look at the lineage of Jesus, you see life upon life, family upon family that mattered in the story you matter in God's story. You may ask, if family is so important, why do I need the church? Well, I'm going to answer that for you. As long as parents do only what parents can do and the church does only what the church can do, we'll only get singular results. But if we combine forces, we'll get multiplied results, and that was God's plan. There is a ministry, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it here in a second, that we love. It's called Orange, Think Orange um, is a great resource. Well, they have this concept that if the home were a color, it would be red to represent the heart. 
If the church were a color, it would be yellow to represent a light shining on Jesus. And, and those colors are great, but when you bring them together, you get an all-new color. You get orange, and that's even more powerful. And that is what God intended. It is dangerous to compartmentalize your faith. It is dangerous to you and your children's future if you keep your faith at church, if you rely on the church to teach faith to your children, or if you only let God into certain areas of your life. That teaches a lesson to your children that you do not want to teach them. The church and the home are where God demonstrates who he is to the world. We need each other. You need to be here. Your children need to be here. We need to work together. So community is one of the greatest gifts that the church can give your children, and that is my second point. Second strategy for training, training healthy Bible-believing children is building community around them. The church will never outdo culture in entertainment. Like, our kids' church will never outdo Hollywood or Disney World. But culture can never outdo churches when it comes to creating community. When you make this an important part of their lives, you consciously and subconsciously produce a norm in them, a deep understanding of, I need other believers. We do this for ourselves also. Your child needs at least five adults in their life speaking the same gospel that you're teaching them. And I'm not just talking to parents in here, because we are all children of God, and we are all still in this process. We need other believers in our lives speaking the same gospel to us. We need a network, and we need to be part of that network. Rick Joyner says, In fact, whether or not a student remains involved in a faith community is tied to the number of adults who influence that person spiritually. Look for these people. Take them up on every offer. Invest in the adults that invest in your children. Make it easy for them. Don't make it hard. Help them appreciate them. But remember... You've been given the charge. They can never do what you can do as well as you have been equipped to do it. It's your charge. When the church and home are saying the same thing, it is powerful. When we work together, we are an unstoppable force against the influences of the world. So the third strategy to raising Bible-believing, Jesus-loving kids is to give them a big story to believe in. One of the ways that we can do that is by serving with them. It shows them that the world is bigger than just their lives. Many young people are leaving the church for what seems like a bigger story. Let God's story be big in your life and in the life of your children. Disciple making is as much about serving as it is anything else. When we live with a small view of life and our place in God's story, we miss the adventure and the passion. We must not withhold this from our children. Without a big view of God, man will always be searching for something bigger. Give that to your children. Not giving your children an opportunity to serve will hinder the development of a compassionate heart. It leaves them paralyzed in their faith. It's the difference between coming to church and being the church. Now, I didn't recognize this until I was done developing this point, but did you notice what those three points in the strategy were? It was Christ, community, and cause. Like, God did that without me even recognizing it. It was pretty cool. So once we have a strategy, we have to be deliberate about it. That's my second point, is being deliberate. Deuteronomy, I'm going to turn there. You can turn there if you want. Deuteronomy 6. 6, 6 through 7, it says this. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. This right here, this is that. This is why why we're deliberate about our children. This is why we make a big deal out of them. This is why we do baby dedications. This is why we have kids' church and nursery available. This is why we encourage you guys in your your training of them. And so it breaks it down. It says, when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. These is the natural natural rhythm of life. Now, again, that resource that I was telling you about, Orange, it is a great, great resource. I encourage you guys. um, We even send home these in the nursery which they, they talk about some of those things. They've got these phase books 
this is kind of like the cliff notes on it, and this is a little more portable. We have these for sale at the children's check-in if you would be interested in any of these. They break down the phases of your child's life. And they kind of explain to you what is important to them at this point. What do you need to be teaching them about God at this point in their life? It's a great resource. Well, what they do is they take those four points and they, they break it down into mealtime, drive time, bedtime, and morning time. Eat together. And during your mealtimes, mentor them. During your drive time, take advantage of it. Listen to encouraging music because it makes a difference. Talk to them. Pray with them. Encourage them to pray. During bedtime, create a routine where the Bible and prayer is included so they just know it's part of the rhythm of our life. It's what we do. And in the morning, send them off with truth to meditate on. You've got to be deliberate with the times that you have with your children. Tony Evans says this, in order to raise our kids with the skills to not only survive, but also to thrive in the world, we need to raise children with the ability to discern what the world puts in front of them to lure them into bondage, whether that be emotional, spiritual, financial, or relational. Again, your job is not to make your kids happy. It's not to be their best friends. You will not find that mandate in the word of God. Your job is to make them like Jesus. We have made our children experientially rich but relationally poor. We have carpooled them all over the city, making sure they are educated in many things while we have a generation that is illiterate in communication. Statistics show that for all the opportunities we've given our children as a corporate society, they are more depressed and lonely than the generations before. We must build truth in them through relationship, not programs and not religion. I once heard a quote, it has become my parenting mantra, that it is easier to train a child than to change a man. Creating good godly habits in your children is one of the most loving things you can do for them. It will make life better for them in the long run. Children are capable of most everything, anything you require of them. We have to parent with the end game in mind. We have to ask ourselves, in our parenting, and guys, I know it. I know this is hard when you're looking at that sweet little face and the puppy dog eyes. But we have to ask ourselves, is a boy or a man our end game? Do we want to raise a self-centered girl or a competent woman? We have to parent with the end result in mind. If a boy isn't taught to be kind and thoughtful to the people around him, he will grow into a man who is not thoughtful to the people around him. If we let our, chill, our little girl think that the world revolves around her, she will grow into a woman who thinks the world revolves around her and she will not age well because right. life will be very, very mean to her. So the third thing that we've got to be is consistent. I'm going to read you a couple of scriptures about consistency. The first one is James 1.4. And it says this, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete lacking, not lacking anything. That's the goal, to be mature and complete and not lack any, lacking anything, but we have to persevere in order for that to be the truth. The next one is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And it's this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. That's consistency. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Be consistent in your deliberate strategy. Children can sniff out inconsistency faster than my dog can sniff out a tree. Like Chris, Pastor Chris, he will, he will hide it in his pocket or put it under a blanket. The dog knows where it is every time. Children are looking for a crack in your resolve. This is perhaps the most difficult part of all of life, the consistency part. But there is a life-changing key that God has given us. It gives us the staying power. It fuels our energy. It ignites our hope. It helps us keep the end game in sight. And it's found in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray continually. Prayer is the undergirding of everything we do for our children. We plan and strategize like it depends on us, but we pray like it depends on God because it does. Mark Batterson says, you don't have to do everything right as a parent, but there is one thing you cannot afford to get wrong. That one thing is prayer. You'll never be a perfect parent, but you can be a praying parent. Prayer is the difference in you fighting for God and God fighting for you. Pray God's will for your children and not yours. Ask him to show you the way they should go. He will direct you in order to direct them. Then teach them to pray. 
So important. Give them that gift. Teach them how to pray. Now, if you would like to read more about praying for your children, I'll tell you a resource that is amazing is Mark Batterson's book, Praying Circles Around Your Children. Short little book, easy to read. Um, it will bless your life. Now, we all have, I told you I was keeping today short. The kids are going to be very happy about that. So we all have about the same amount of time allotted to us before our children graduate. It's about 936 weeks. And so I brought a jar of marbles today to represent that. There are 936 marbles in here. Now, when I was parenting babies and toddlers, I thought it was going to kill me. I, I did. I think we all think that at times. Um, I, you know, people would tell me, enjoy it because it goes by so quickly, but I was just trying to survive, and I think every parent in here understands that season. Um, I would have these conversations with God. I'd be like, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand why it's so hard. Like, why did you create me the way that I am? Like, are introverts supposed to have children? Like, why do they need to touch me so much? Why do they talk so much? And I, I really, there were times I thought, am I going to be the first parent to die from overstimulation? <laughs> So far, I'm still here, so it didn't happen. But can I just tell you that if this jar represented my oldest daughter, it is now only about a fourth of the way full. Those were the simple years. I understand that now, that every season is hard. Every season has its difficulties, but they go by so quickly. They fly by. Be strategic. Be deliberate. Be consistent with the life you've been given. And pray like it is your mission, because it is. We only get one chance at this life. My goal is to arrive at the feet of Jesus and say that I spent it all. Spend everything on your children. Pour yourselves out on those you mentor. They will be all that you can take to heaven with you. Help them get there. Help them find Jesus. That is the end game. See, on a, on a normal day, doing what he normally did, Moses was taking care of the sheep that were assigned to him. And then Jesus, and then God showed up, and he called it holy ground. Do not despise what looks small and insignificant. Because that's only the way it looks in man's eyes. See, a mustard seed looks small until you realize the magnitude of what it can do. If it doesn't look like it matters, do it anyway. If they waste all of your effort, do it anyway. Like, this is your, this is your holy act of worship before your holy God. Pour everything out on him. Allow him to spend you however he chooses to spend you. Even if he wants to spend you on other people. Give him something to use. Let him use you to change everything because that's what he wants to do. And I wanna encourage you guys in here today, whether you are parenting, whether you are grandparents, whether you are mentoring, whatever season of life you are in, I wanna encourage you that today could be the day that everything changes. This year could be the year that they have an encounter with God. Do you believe it? If we believe it, then we need to live like we believe it, right? Would you um, stand up as we go back into worship?